This is Wraith from Wraith Rain. I'm an author of serialized gay romance fiction. Every week on this podcast, I'll be reading a chapter from one of my gay fantasy shifter serials called Dragon's Reign. I'll explain at the break how you can find out more about this story and others I write. So let's get to it. Chapter 64 Spoils of War There was a wild whoosh of air that flattened Caden's hair and nearly sent the toast flying. A huge green dragon's head was suddenly level with the balcony. Green smoke billowed around its jaws. Caden's lungs tightened and he knocked over his chair, striving to get away from the noxious fumes. Esme continued to sit at the table, sipping her tea and staring straight ahead as if Valerian had not just gassed their breakfast. Holding his throat and drawing in wheezing gasps, Caden was almost flattened by another burst of powerful wind as Alarian rose up in the air so that his clawed toes were hanging two dozen feet above them. Then Alarian transformed and he gracefully dropped the balcony into what Caden thought of as a superhero pose. Caden was still hacking up a lung as Alarian got to his feet and grinned at Esme. He didn't spare one look at Caden, but Caden's heart was in his throat, as well as poison gas. But evidently being a shifter meant he couldn't be killed by it. But as he leaned over and hacked some more, he thought he might drop a lung or two on the ground. Iolaire covered its nose with its front claws and closed its eyes tightly. That was when Caden realized his eyes were stinging as if acid was flung in them. He let out a cry and dug his palms into his eyes. Finally, when the stinging eased, he drew his hands off his eyes and stared blearily at Alarian. Totally nude and completely unashamed of it, Alarian strutted over to the seat that had been Caden's, righted the chair, and sat down in it. Still grinning, Alarian ate Caden's bacon, which just added insult to injury. Esme, what a glorious morning! Alarian inhaled another piece of his bacon. Esme continued to sip her tea even as the green poisonous mist swirled around her before disappearing altogether. It was only then that Caden realized that Alarian was here with him. The green dragon would realize at any second who Caden was me. Panic had him taking a step backwards. Could he somehow retreat before Alarian noticed him? Alarian's hand shut out with the unused coffee cup that had been set out but Caden had not used. He was not a coffee person. He thought of it as water gone wrong. He froze at Alarian's movement and was prepared for the green dragon to crow at finding the elusive Iolaire. Alarian, though, waggled the coffee cup at him. Fill this. He didn't even look at Caden as he moved the cup towards him. Must I repeat myself? Fill this. He doesn't know who I am. He thinks I'm a servant or something, Caden realized. Caden tried not to feel offended. This was a good thing after all, yet it just proved all the more that Alarian did not care for Iolaire. Caden met Esme's eyes. She nodded her head almost imperceptibly. He trusted her judgment, so he took Alarian's cup and went over to the buffet, where there was a silver coffee urn. Two sugars and a splash, just a splash of cream, Alarian ordered over his shoulder. Your staff, Esme, is horrible, though I suppose compared to dear Sarai, this one must be a treasure. Caden gritted his teeth, but he looked over at Esme again. She gave him a meaningful look. My people serve me well, Esme murmured. Alarian's brow beetled. How a person treats their guests must not be as important in your territory, then. Guests are treated exceptionally well, Alarian. You, however are not a guest, she remarked. Alarian took a large bite of croissant and talking with his mouth full and gesturing around the space to, this is not your castle, this is Valerius's. This is his food and drink. So I am just taking my part of his largesse here rather than in my assigned space. He glared over his shoulder. Speaking of drink, where's my coffee? Coming, Caden grunted. His hands hovered over the sugar bowl, considering dumping in as much sugar as the coffee would dissolve, but then he realized the goal was not to draw attention to himself. While the plan was to reveal himself at some point, it wasn't to do so to Alarian. Not yet. Not without Valerius here anyways. 
So he plopped two cubes of sugar into the dark brown fluid and a splash of cream that turned it a golden tan. He stirred it with a spoon that was designed to look like a seashell at the bottom. He then presented the coffee cup to Alarian, who glared at it. Caden suppressed a sigh and set it down on top of the table. That gave him a clear view of how his entire plate had been devoured by Alarian. His stomach rumbled and Iolaire looked mournful. So, what brings you here to eat your breakfast, other than showing off that Iolaire's gift finally wore off? Esme asked Hartley. She gave Caden another look that indicated he should stay and listen. He had been half tempted to leave, but now he saw the wisdom in staying. Alarian would speak far more openly about Iolaire, not knowing that Iolaire was right there. So he retreated a few steps to the buffet and stood there as he imagined a proper servant would do. Close enough to spring into the action to fill coffee or offer a scone, but far enough away to give the illusion of privacy. He wondered, however, if he had just watched too many episodes of Downtown Abbey. Alarian, though, paid no more attention to him than if he had been no more interesting than the stonework. Alarian swallowed another bite of buttery croissant before he answered her, I come to spend my time with the blue dragon. We have not been in one another's presence in 30 years. It is but a moment, but yet much has happened in that time, yes? We had not seen each other in over a thousand years before that meeting, Alarian. And much had happened in that time, too, she answered dryly. So why are you really here? Alarian gave her a wolfish smile. Ah, Esme, your mousetrap mind is a pleasure. I'm not sure it gives me pleasure to be thought of to have a mousetrap mind. Her voice was as dry as the Sahara now. Alarian shook a fork at her with a spear of egg upon it. You are smart, clever, very clever, strategic. Yes, well, all of those things are true. Esme inclined her head, perhaps a little flattered in spite of herself, considering that her intelligence had been a little battered by being betrayed. Maybe she needed to hear that. Which is why I do not believe you are behind this bombing in the square. Alarian scraped his teeth over the fork, the yellow eggs disappearing. Caden's stomach growled again. He surreptitiously grabbed a mini blueberry muffin out of the basket beside him and stuck the whole thing in his mouth after peeling off the paper. He repressed an audible groan as a sweet, rich goodness of the moist muffin smooshed between his tongue and the roof of his mouth. Oh, interesting of you. Esme shrugged and took another sip of tea. You came here to give me moral support. Valerius does not believe I'm behind it, so that is all that matters. Valerius, Larian barked and bits of egg covered the table. Esme's face scrunched up with disgust but it quickly smoothed back to nonchalance. She handed him her hat napkin to wipe the wet, partially masticated egg off of his lips and chin. Caden's gorge rose a bit as Alarian negligently smeared the remnants away before tossing the napkin on the table and resuming eating. It's Valerius's territory that was affected, and he is our... Esme gestured with her right ringed hand. The jewels on them flashed in the sunlight as she tried to find the right words. He's one of us! Alarian pounded a fist on the table, which caused the dishes to jump and rattle. He's not above us. He's not our king. She lifted an eyebrow. When he glared at her, face reddening to tomato-like shade, she continued with an almost sigh. Alarian, you can shake your fists and cry to the heavens, but Valerius is our leader. Only because he has not been challenged. Alarian spat egg and saliva across the table, landing just inches from Esme's lap. Caden swallowed his muffin and his stomach rumbled again, but not with hunger this time. Challenged? Esme's sculpted eyebrows rose as a smile twitched her lipstick mouth. Yeah, that's totally crap, Caden thought. You couldn't defeat Raziel if it had both wings tied behind its back, Alarian. Iolaire let out a chirp of agreement. I am stronger. Mephs' poison will cause Raziel to drown in his own blood. Alarian's face was suffused with an almost purple color. Are you going to challenge Valerius? Esme held Alarian's gaze steadily. The passionate response abruptly cooled as Alarian speared another forkful of eggs and grinned at her. Of course, we will fight over Iolaire. Caden's cheeks alternately flushed and paled. He was going to be the cause of Valerius and Alarian fighting? 
Well, that didn't altogether surprise him, but this sounded more serious. Valerian wanted to challenge Valerius. That could lead to war. I hope you are enjoying Dragon's Reign so far. One of the things I enjoy most about Dragon's Reign is the world building. Creating a complex and full world is fascinating to me. Answering the questions, what if shifters were real and out in the open, and how would the world change and be is like catnip to me. While I asked the same sorts of questions when I started the massive vampire serial story, Everdark. In Everdark, an ancient vampire king gets awakened by a bold urban explorer out to prove that vampires exist, along with his skeptical best friend. The two former humans are thrown into a world of vampires that exists right alongside their own, including developing their own vampire powers. A vampire romance with two main couples, many characters, magical powers, and a huge world of vampire culture and mythology awaits. If you sign up for our list, you will get the first 10 chapters of Everdark free. That's over 48,000 words to read. A link is down in the description below. Esme led a, a trill of laughter. <laughs> My dear Larian, that is the most insane idea you've ever had, and that's saying something. His green eyes narrowed at her. Do you not think I can win? She shrugged. In all honesty, no. Not that you won't give it a brilliant go. But in the end, Valerius and Raziel will rip your wings off and use them as flaws. But that was not the cause of my laughter. Caden could see Illyrian's jaw working as he clearly was furious that Esme did not think him the winner in this putative battle. So what is causing you to laugh at me? Valerian hissed. That you think Iolera would want you, even if you did, in the most unlikely of events, win. Esme held up her teacup to Caden. He quickly got a warming pot of tea and came over to fill her cup before retreating back to the buffet. He managed to snag a piece of bacon as he set the teapot on the trivet. Iolera must be with the strongest. Valerian scoffed as he chewed once more with his mouth open. Esme's eyelids fluttered shut for a moment as if the sight were just too terrible to bear. I do not believe it works that way. Mephis has told me the rules. Alarian leaned back and spread his naked legs. To Caden's horror, his cock stirred as he spoke of Iolaire. Whoever wishes to mate with Iolaire must challenge and defeat any comers. The last dragon standing wins. Caden's mouth fell open with an audible click. He almost spat the bacon onto the floor. He quickly closed his mouth and swallowed it down. He would not waste good bacon on Ilarian. Scylla tells me otherwise, Esme said after she sipped her tea. Scylla tells me that while we may challenge each other to prove we are the most worthy of Iolaire, the truth is that Iolaire can choose anyone it wants to mate with. That's exactly right, Caden thought. Iolaire and I get to choose. Iolaire twittered softly, but Caden's stomach lurched. He thought of the fact that he wasn't worthy of Iolaire. He had been at the right place at the right time, but Iolaire had just been looking for an excuse to join with someone, anyone, in order to be with Raziel. Iolaire and Raziel were destined to be together. Valerius and him, well... If Valerius had any idea of how unworthy Caden was, well, he would be furious and resentful. He wouldn't want to be saddled with Caden. No, no, I am going to be better. I am going to be worthy of him somehow, Caden thought. Bah, absurd. Even if that was true, Iolair will choose the strongest. It is only logical. Alarian scoffed as he shoveled in more eggs. The laws of nature apply even to spirits. And what laws are those? Esme gazed at Alarian over the top of her cup. The strongest make the rules. Alarian laughed uproariously, clearly in love with his joke. Caden rolled his eyes. Esme smothered a look of disgust by sipping her tea at that moment. But I am not here to discuss that, as I know you are not in the running for Iolair's hand. Alarian chewed noisily. Esme winked to Caden. I don't know, Alarian. I have quite a bit to offer, Iolair. Alarian's hand with the fork in it froze halfway to his mouth. He stared at her. Such as? What? 
He couldn't quite hide his disbelief. He clearly didn't understand how a mature woman such as Esme could have anything to offer. Caden's eyes narrowed. If he wasn't completely in love with Valerius, she would actually be his second choice. Not a love match, but for a mentor. Someone he would willingly be able to support and learn from. She smiled thinly. Delights of which you cannot even imagine. Alarian snorted, but didn't say anything rude, which was the first point in his favor since he had shown up. I am here to discuss this bombing business. Esme stiffened. I can't imagine why. It is true that my territory is, is not convulsed by lawlessness and terror attacks, Alarian said with a shrug. I rule my people. I do not let them have the illusion that they rule themselves. No, I would think that your people have no illusions about such freedom. Esme's smile flattened, but Alarian did not even notice. Yeah, well, it is best that the people know where they stand. You indulge them and you get chaos. Alarian shrugged again. So, if your territory is so immune to such chaos, since you are so clear with your people, why are you concerned about the bombing? Esme pressed. Now that was a good question. Caden grew alert. Was Alarian lying about not having such problems in his territory? Was this a worldwide conspiracy like Esme had said? Do you remember the phrase, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless void, and the soul of soulless conditions? It is the opium of the people, Alarian asked. Or as most people summarize it, religion is the opiate of the masses. Karl Marx, yes, why? Esme asked. In the beginning, I allowed the faith into my territory. They worshipped the spirits and the dragon spirits above all, so it seemed harmless, perhaps even useful, Alarian said as he took a swig of his coffee. Caden stilled. He had never considered the faith as a mover in any of the bad things that happened in the world. But now they were seemingly more and more suspicious in his eyes. Yet if he thought at all of the group that his mother was a part of, they had always seemed harmless if slightly silly to him. The dressing in white and singing, God, that song about him and Eilaire, was so disarming. Could they possibly be behind a worldwide conspiracy to, to do what? Create disasters so that more spirits emerge into the world? For one moment, that caused him pause. He had looked up what Eilaire's name was associated with after Wally's reaction to it. It was the name of a yacht that had sunk in 1919 with great loss of life. The yacht had struck rocks just yards from shore, and yet 201 out of 283 people on board had died. It was a disaster. The crowning sorrow of a war. A beautiful yet strange name to choose, unless it had other meanings. He looked at Eilaire. The dragon spirit was once again snoozing. Valerian bored it completely. He supposed that was good that Eilaire was not scared of Valerian. Then again, they could will Valerian back to human form at any time they wanted. Well, he hoped that was true. Maybe it only worked so well because Valerian had not been expecting him to be able to do that. Maybe now it wouldn't work since he was aware of the possibility, or it'd be a lot harder to do it. Esme put her teacup down in the saucer. Has the faith done anything in your territory, Larian? Of course not. I would stamp out any such, such perfidy. And yet you're bringing it up, Esme pointed out. Alarian leaned back and shrugged. There might have been some small unrest, perhaps people claiming that the spirits wanted to come in, but the veil had to be pierced. Veil had to be pierced. Esme lowered her head and stared at Alarian hard. Do you not know what they believe? Alarian looked disbelieving. Caden knew what he was talking about. His mom had babbled often enough about it that he absorbed most of the faith's beliefs, one of which was that there was a veil between this world and the world that the spirits inhabited. Crises, disasters, tragedies, great acts of heroism or villainy pierced the veil and allowed the villains to come through. The faith tracked down as many joinings as they could in order to determine if there were patterns. What they found was that there were more joinings in times of war, starvation, the horrors of slavery, 
murder, and so on and so forth. Tragedies caused clusters of joinings. But I never thought that the faith would take that conclusion and try to create more disasters, Caden thought. They believe that the spirits are crying out. They want to find human bodies to inhabit in order to uplift the world. Alarian let out a bark of laughter. Ha! Please! I suppose it is true in some way, but not in the way that these religious people believe. No, I imagine not. Your idea of paradise is not theirs, Esme said tightly. Do not act like you want to live in their crazy world. Alarian waved a hand through the air as if he would topple over a line of crazed cultists. No, I do not, she nodded. I stamp out one flare of their insanity, only to have it flare in another place, and then another, and then another. No matter what I do, no matter how I crack down, they keep coming back. Alarian slammed his hand against the table again, and the cutlery danced. The harder you come down in then, the more martyrs you make. You'll only increase the amount of people against you, Esme said sadly. You cannot use force to end this. And what would you have me do? Speak nicely to them, give them gifts, accede to their demands, Alarian snorted. Well, perhaps I will accede to some of them. What are their demands? Esme asked. Caden wondered that too. Since the bombing, there had been no one claiming credit for it. And that didn't make a lot of sense. Acts of terror were to create, well, terror. Do this or we will kill more. But no one had said anything about what needed to happen to stop the violence. Alarian gave her a razor blade smile. They want a war. A war to end all wars. I hope you enjoyed this week's chapter. Just a reminder that if you join Wraith Rain as a member, the membership is 15 to 20 episodes ahead of the free podcast. If you'd like to join and listen to all those extra podcasts, not to mention getting access to the other stories and manga on Wraith Rain, a link is down below.